Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Med School Minutes podcast, where we discuss what it takes to attend and successfully complete a medical program. This show is brought to you by St. James School of Medicine. Here is your host, Kashik Gua. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Med School Minutes, where we talk about everything MD related with a focus on international students, specifically Caribbean students. Today, we have a very interesting guest. His name is Dr. Uh, Stavros. And uh, after finishing his MD, he's chosen a path of entrepreneurship to and dedicated his career to really helping students um, realize their dreams of uh, making it and passing the exams. Um, he has over uh, almost two decades of experience managing and handling and helping students do better in step one, step two, and step three. And uh, he's essentially an expert on the exam. So we're here to talk to him about what the changes in the uh, structure of the exams in both step one and step two are. Um, and generally, you know, his passion and his um, choice to not really practice medicine, but go into a field where he is still involved with medicine, but at the same time, helping uh, students as much as they can. So uh, so without any further without further ado, uh, let's wel welcome Dr. Stavros. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Stavros. Um, why don't you give us a quick background? This is how we always start our podcast. Uh, we always request our guests to give us a quick background about uh, themselves. Well, hi everyone, I'm Dr. Stavros Vuyukulis, born and raised in New York. Uh, uh, I went to Biochem, my Manhattan College undergrad in biochemistry, four years, and then I went to the Levy School of St. James for med school. I did realize as I was prepping for the board exams that I had a, a certain purpose, certain goal, certain calling, and then I then worked on USMLE prep because I realized that no matter what I did, it was very challenging to pursue these exams and do very well, right? All of us mm -hmm. have had issues in these. And, and unfortunately, your, your, your career, your, your future in medicine is dictated and basically set in stone because of these scores, right? So what I did was uh, from being in medicine, I realized I had more of a passion to work with students and physicians to crack the code and help them pass the board exams. So 15 years later, uh, I'm on my fifth uh, company as far as uh, adapting to how the USMLE adapts, right? right? So we adapt to better ways to prep our students. And now I'm here talking to you today to make sure that all our students out there internationally and in the States know as much as possible for step one, step two. So then it makes it easier for them. So they, they don't have to settle for less. They can right. then shoot for the stars and achieve their goals and whatever residency they want. So here I am today to uh, provide my knowledge of 15 plus years so you right. guys can all profit and then be better physicians right. for improving our healthcare. Right. So essentially, they're uh, twofold. Uh, we're, we're killing two birds with one stone, so to speak, sure. by talking to you, Dr. Stavros. Well, one is um, we're talking about, so obviously you went through, got your MD and everything, but then you chose to be a serial entrepreneur. Um, completely s aside from running a regular practice, uh, and you chose to go into this route, uh, we definitely want to pick your brain a little bit about sure. um, once you get an MD, what can you do with it other than practice medicine? I again, I mean, I just, because for a lot of our students, it's like I just, I, my only alternative is to become a hospitalist. But sure. that isn't true, obviously, as your, um, uh, your like, a shining example of that oh, and you. and you're not just the only one we have several physicians who's gone on to start various consulting companies that actually consult with hospitals sure. entirely admin purposes etc cetera, etc cetera. so we want to talk a little bit about that and the other aspect is obviously with 15 plus years of experience with five companies as you said uh you have adapted to the changes in the usm if there is anybody who I would consider to be an expert of, at the USMLE exam, it is definitely you because you've been seeing the changes firsthand from the time you took it uh, to the time when there were two two types, uh, two CS or step two exams, <laughs> then becoming one, then yes. eventually becoming a very involved exam 
and then um, you know the step one pass fail going away so uh, let's start with uh, you and like what alternatives do you think I, I, or what would you advise students because you know unfortunately medicine is such an involved practice like you pay so much of money you invest so much of time a lot of people just don't think that beyond becoming a hospitalist or beyond practicing i don't have alternatives what would your advice be to that student well i mean it's a great question i'm happy we're talking about it um i myself i'll go back a second so then we can mm -hmm. move forward with this this question i realized through my rotations and my studies not only did i love prepping and teaching but i realized that it was more for me than just being in the hospital. So I was mm -hmm. honest to myself and I was right. very lucky that I, 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 you know, I was really enjoying what I was doing and prepping students. But students now need to realize that you focus hard, you go to school, like you said, you invest, you get into residency if you choose residency. And then what do you do after? A lot of times people, I've seen right. doctors not finish residency, they jump out of residency and they go, well, I, I can't even finish it. I don't know what to do right. now because right. they were so into surgery and anesthesia. Yeah. So what I can say to our students now watching, listening and watching now is you got to be honest with yourself and say, okay, am I choosing internal medicine because I love it? Or mm -hmm. maybe I'm in love with the idea or am I okay. going to surgery because I, I love it, but do I really know what surgeons do? Right. And other times people are like, hey, I burn out. I'm done. I do not want to continue medicine. So if you have an MD, well, yeah, there's, you can be a consultant. There's many different avenues out there to say, well, okay, I went to school. I finished my medical degree. Either you finish residency or not, are you licensed or not? So it all depends, right? If you're mm -hmm. licensed, you can move on to consulting different companies, pharmaceutical companies versus you finish MD and then you say, well, you can then venture into certain specialties that can use your knowledge, right? Four years of medical school is a lot, guys, right? right. You do two yeah. years in, in, in classroom, you do yeah. two years of rotations. People can use that knowledge for their advantage and yours in any in, in majority of specialties out there in businesses. Yeah. Um, in this vein, I actually wanted to talk about this. Uh, this is one of our partner hospitals. Um, they, <clears throat> the CFO reached out to me very nice. recently. Nice. And uh, they have a program uh, where they train financial analysts. And they called me up, the CFO called me up and he's like, you know, I really want to have MDs come for this program. And I was like, Wait, but they're MDs. Like, why would they go into finance? And he's like, well, you know, I'll have you know that. Then the CFO was like, I'm an MD for our MBBS from India. I came to the United States several years ago and I didn't match the first attempt and I needed money. So I yeah. started working here. Sure. And he's like, I, he, you know, and, and billing and finance, it's not in a hospital. It seems like it's a very different function. So I'm a CPA. So I, you know, know a lot about working in corporate America and being in consulting and stuff like that. But it seems like finance and hospital serves a very different purpose. Most yeah. in most companies, finance is, quote unquote, a back office function or it's a cost center. If you're not necessarily generating revenues. But in a hospital, finance can actually generate revenues. Uh, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong uh, from your experience, Dr. Stavros, but he said that he feels the most successful financial professionals within a hospital system are MDs because they understand, they know sure. how to code certain ailments in a certain way that yes. boost the performance of the hospital and make it look better in the eyes of, say, Medicare, Medicaid, different exactly. governments and stuff like that. And he's like, it's just easier to train because, you know, <clears throat> if somebody comes in with a superficial ailment, but they have something underlying, a financial, a CPA who has no medical training is not really going to understand that. Sure. Whereas an MD does. And, and to me, that was very surprising. So this particular training program, it starts off with uh, like a resident salary, but within about two years, you become a full-blown financial uh, associate, and then you're kind of on a track for a CFO position. And this you particular know, gentleman is a CFO for 50 different hospitals right now. I mean, that's very impressive. And the reason, I mean, and that's it's nice that we're sharing this knowledge because, you know, 
when one of my previous companies, we were employing physicians to be mm -hmm. coaches and mentors. Right. Um, and most of the people, all 500 applicants, 520 actually, they were all American students yeah. who graduated or either right. finished residency right. or in the middle of, they just dropped out. And they're all American okay. grads from right. top university programs. There's always right. why I say this because they're burning out, right? Mm -hmm. So what did, what, did, what did all those 520 people do? Reached out to me to get a pay cut from 450, 350, yeah. 250 to less than, you know, roughly 80 to 100,000 yeah. for a coaching position. So, well, right. You're giving up all that opportunity, all that time yeah. invested in your life. Yes. Be happy. You see, that's what people need to right, understand. Right, so right, right. If it's one of you that, hey, I, I don't want to continue. Yeah, there's mm -hmm. a lot of companies that, for example, short-term disability, long-term disability, insurance companies, instead of having someone who has no knowledge uh, of medicine, they say, well, we'll hire nurses and or MDs to consult and be like the head of the department to yeah. say, well, if someone has a back issue, they had a herniated disc, yeah. do they four weeks or 12 weeks? Well, if you don't know the reason behind, like are they standing versus sitting in their occupation? Right, are they overweight? Right. Are they have other risk factors? Maybe they need 10 weeks. So you see right. men, MEs yeah. are needed everywhere. It's just up to the individual. Do you want to practice medicine? Yes. Or, hey, I'm just tired. I'm burnt out. I want to have a family. I want to see my mm -hmm. wife, my husband, my kids. And unfortunately, in the system, even though it's a beautiful system, you work in many hours and it's not for everyone. It isn't. Yes, yes, it's, yeah. I've seen the numbers. So that's why yeah. you have to have an option to go elsewhere. Right. right. So uh, tell me about this decision, because the decision that you took, like, as you said, while you're doing your rotations, you realized that this was you wanted to be stay involved yeah. in teaching. Yeah. And eventually you kind of came back. That takes courage. And how do you, because, you know, as you pointed out, it's a big investment. It's an investment yeah. of time. It's an investment of money, primarily. These are the two biggest factors. Sure. And it's almost like, oh, hey, I've already invested so much of time and money. I don't care about my mental health. I don't care about what I want. It's just I'm already down this path and I'm going to keep barreling down it. Which, you know, I mean, there are a lot of uh, mental health issues that uh, physicians are facing. And that's right. been exasperated over the last you know, three, four years during the pandemic. Sure. Um, how did you manage that decision? Like, w what kind of a support system did you have? Did you go through a lot of counseling? Did you uh, talk to a lot of friends? W what were the steps that you take to really realize that decision? Because I talked to a lot of um, students who are brilliant students, but they're kind of at that cusp that you're talking about is, you know, I don't know that I want to do this for about three, four more years. You know, I'm, I'm kind of done, but I also want to have a meaningful life and I want to be, but at the same time, I don't know what to do. Uh, how do you make that decision? And their biggest thing is I've already invested. I'm almost there. There's light at the end of the tunnel, yeah. but that's the light I don't want to walk towards. Well, you know, well, just to, to add to that, that's why, that's why when you are preparing for step one, step two, maybe pursuing medicine, instead of focusing on something that you have a passion for that maybe you just heard about, you need mm -hmm. to take this rotation seriously to say, well, I want to be OBGYN. I want to do, let's say, peds or surgery. I will invest my time now in medical school to see, hey, is it for me? Because you might love the idea of being an OB, guy and physician, right. but maybe when you find out the hours are that long, you don't want to do that. So that's why a lot of students, they, they have that love, they get in and they drop off, right? Okay. For me, I realized, and this goes back and it goes into my roots, and this is why I do what I do today. It stems from passion for medicine. I was a pioneer in my, in my family. Parents, mm -hmm. Greek, love them. They did everything for us, for me and my sister. Um, not in medicine, so I was the first person to pursue. I realized in the hospitals, through St. James, in the amazing rotations, working 60, 70-hour weeks, I realized some specialties were for me and some were not. Mm -hmm. And if I had maybe is the school did everything for me, but the physicians I worked with, they did everything for me too. But I realized later that if I maybe had a different experience in let's say ER versus surgery, I would have gone down that path. Instead, I said, I don't want to be stuck in the hospital 80 hour weeks, writing notes, seeing patients, being exhausted, right. maybe not possibly having a marriage, maybe losing my wife, a lot of family, people that I know, right. the voices. I saw the statistics ahead of me and I'm like, yeah. well, I love medicine. Yeah. Yeah. But I also started doing the coaching mentoring on the side and that started blowing up. So I said, well, right. 
I can continue medicine or I can pursue my, my actual passion, which is still in medicine, but then right. making sure doctors get into the, the profession itself, right? Right, so, right, right. Not easy. Right. My friend, it's it's a lot, it's not easy. It, it's it's a little luck to see what you're okay. good into and yeah. risk. So that's what I that's what I took. So um, you know, this is a big debate that is always in our offices. Uh, in, so in my opinion, I, I should preface this by saying that there's truly four real professions in this world. No, no disrespect to other folks, but <laughs> there are cool. four real professions in this world. Okay. One is farmer, one is teacher, one is engineer, and one is doctor. Everything okay. else is fluff. Mind you, I'm a trained CPA. Um, <laughs> so my point is that with these four professions, you can build civilizations sure. um, and, and you don't need anything else and everything else kind of follows. Um, keeping that in mind, I also think entrepreneurs have a very important uh, role, but that is once things are like, you know, in an economy like the USA, entrepreneurship is, is very well respected. But you've been both. You've been a physician and you've been an entrepreneur. In your mind, obviously, there's definitely some synergy that you're a physician who's an entrepreneur. But in your mind, which one has more of a, let's call it flex, if you will? Um, being an entrepreneur, being a physician. Well, I mean, for me, I, I've been blessed with doing both. But mm -hmm. again, the reason why I say this is because I work with so many doctors and students now that are in residency and they hit certain, certain specialties yeah. and then they're stuck because they go, well, I invested my time in pediatrics. I don't want to be a pediatrician. What do you do right. now? That's challenging, right? So I come up with a family of all business, family, father, mother, all the Greek families that I know, my cousins, and all, no one was a doctor, all in business. Right. So right. I was fortunate to also have that in my Exposure. roots. Exposure. Yeah. Now, that being said, a lot of times doctors want to be businessmen. They can't. The businessmen can't be doctors. They have right. to learn it, right? You have to practice it. But the way I look at it is I, I personally have much more freedom, much more because, again, I love what I do. Right. I can work from anywhere. I had a morning webinar before we yeah. got on this podcast. 150 doctors and students, step one prep. Those yeah. individuals, my passion is to help them pass step one to hopefully get to where they need to be, right. to be a better healthcare right. system in the States, right? right? So for me, I love business, but I, I was able to merge both business yes. and medicine than just being business yeah. somewhere and not enjoying the medicine, medical aspect of, because I love medicine, guys. I yeah. love it. Yeah, I just don't want to be in the hospital working right. 80 hour weeks anymore. Of I course, just, of course. I, I mean, that makes that. complete sense. Yeah. But that's very interesting they say that. So um, the main flex is that you are a physician entrepreneur as opposed yep. to, you know, it's not one or the other, it's both. That's that's can't pretty cool. I can't, um, I can't, I can't jump and go do something like I might have real estate, family, right. we have real estate, other things. I, it's great. I'm a yeah. lot of money. There's no passion there. My passion is right. medicine. Right, I right, medicine, right, 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 right. So I was lucky to find this. <clears throat> um, so tell us a little bit about your companies. You said you had five. Can you tell us why you had five and sure. what's your latest company do? And uh, can you give us a little background as to how many students you've helped and how long you've been doing this? So... To go back, because I'm um, early 40s, let's say, right, mm -hmm. 45 years old, I've gone through a lot, especially through step prep. And this goes into explaining a little later the timeline of step. Mm -hmm. For anyone to grow and, and be successful, you have to adjust and adapt to the times. Um, right. Those who don't, you can tell. If you if someone provides you advice that isn't uh, updated, it won't work, right? So the companies that I created, um, they're all based upon step one, step two. And as we keep learning and having more success, we can then keep adjusting and adjusting to different prep. Nowadays, okay. live, live in-person classes aren't as, as popular as they were mm -hmm. 10 years ago. Okay. 10 years ago, I had a live course in Chicago, 50 students uh, every month. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, it's all remote, you see. So yeah. we have to keep adjusting and adapting to the lifestyle of USMLE. Okay. We used to have step one, step two, and step three. Like you mentioned, step two, right. CSCK. Yeah. I had a course specifically for CS. We were working side by side with St. James to implement right. that in our studies. And then right. the pandemic came. So right. nowadays, uh, my newest company is USMLE Trainings, where we take 
the technology of Zoom, right? The connecting with everyone in the world. We have mm -hmm. live webinars and make sure that your content is ready for step one, right. but also be a better test taker. Because I right. realized through working with tens of thousands of students that you can learn all you want, but if you don't work to, to improve your test taking skills, yes. you can study for years and then you don't right. pass it. Yeah, oh. talk to us a little bit about that because I have actually noted, noticed students who are very, very good academically and yep. they're actually doing really well in quizzes, in class. Teachers are sure. like, wow, this guy's a great, you know, uh, student. They're definitely going to ace it. But when it comes to the NBME, they're not doing well. And then you talk to them and then you're realizing that they have like this crazy anxiety. They're having the strategies that they're employing in, in again, I'm not an educator, but it just doesn't sound optimal. So talk to me about this test taking strategy. Is there, are you born with it or is, is this something you can develop? Or if you don't have it, are you just, you're never becoming a doctor? It's a skill like anything else, whether you want to play a sport, right? This mm -hmm. is a sport of sorts. It's a skill that, and, and I know because I was in school, St. James, a lot mm -hmm. of universities, everyone does their very best. But we don't really focus on on working on test taking skills. So you know, read the material, read the powerpoints, learn the content. Yes, but then you have a USMLE exam, which is very different than anything else you've ever done before. Mm -hmm. So that's why I realize that if you don't adjust and expose students like St. James yeah. and everybody else watching to the question format, Doc, my friend Doc, whoever's watching, reading the material. You have to apply to the questions, like being in the hospital, right? You're in class right. and you go see patients. In class, I give you PowerPoint presentation findings, right? There's no mm -hmm. connection. So right. when you read a question, you have to be able to pull out the findings and connect. So to answer your question, it needs a lot of time and practice. And that's why one of the main reasons that we do what we do at USMLE trainings is, hey, you got to come to us with knowledge. You're in medical school, right? right. So, okay, you know the basics. The yeah. problem is... Can you put it together in a question, reading, understanding, and connecting? And I see right. a lot of students, American students, international, Caribbean. The biggest common denominator is test taking. They'll study for okay. a year, man. They'll memorize first aid. They fail. Right. Why? Test taking. Okay. It's a common denominator all across the board. Okay. Um, and um, as far as um, these uh, test taking skills are concerned, yep. um, and do you kind of help them like through drills or is it like uh, counseling sessions? W what does that entail? So we meet doctors twice a day, okay. morning and afternoon, which is nice because not only do we do, now we work on accountability, which uh -huh. is another issue that students have. They can't, okay. they need a study partner, they need somebody by their side, they need to be consistent and disciplined. So we meet them mm -hmm. twice a day, an hour each time live and people from all over the world jump on, students and physicians, and we, choose certain systems to attack for the day. So right. I have selected these questions. I go through one by one. I okay. highlight and show them what to do to attack the questions, to save time, to be more efficient and effective, and also to learn to learn the material. Like if it's okay. something of, of concern that I see students having issues with, I always bring it up in our lecture. So they're accountable, they're disciplined, consistent, and I'm telling you, with a little practice, anybody can take the test, but you have to practice okay. test taking skills. Okay. How it's much a, uh, time would you recommend students dedicate for say the step one? Let's just talk oh, about step one. Good question. Um, is it like, you know, because we, I recommend that students should be studying for about eight hours, at least three months before the test. Is that too much, too little? What do you think? To answer the question, I guess and those who know me, I can talk all day. A typical student who has dedicated prep, right? For example, uh -huh. St. James, if you mm -hmm. give them three months of dedicated prep, meaning nothing else but studying, right. yes, seven to nine hours, eight hours okay. a day, three months should be more than enough time to okay. go through the content, answer questions, and move. But there's okay. many variables, right? right? There's many variables involved. So the variables are, are you a good student? Mm -hmm. you, are, did you do well in your basic sciences? Right. Are you able to sit in a in an environment that you choose to study all day? Or are you on YouTube, Netflix, you go hang out, you go, I mean, listen, we've all done that, right? TikTok but now. TikTok, <laughs> uh, you know, Instagram. And then next thing you know, you're studying 10 hours, but you've only had two hours effective prep. So uh, what I realized is 
to answer the question. Anybody who has passed every semester in med school, you know, decently, obviously, you know, and B's, hopefully B's and A's, um, and you have a good three months solid with adjusting and checking out where your weaknesses are and assessing, there is no reason why you can't. But then there's people who have issues with memory, recall, they don't know the content, they can't stay disciplined. Then obviously, if you can only give four hours a day, you still can't do it in three months. It's going to be a lot longer, right? It's a sliding scale. So for the yeah. average, three months, eight hours a day, it is a decent approach. It's just now you have to, to think about the variables for every student right. and then go of from course. there. That's all it is. That's the honest. honest okay. Approach. So um, now let's talk about the test a little bit. Obviously, you've taken the test uh, a couple of years ago yourself. And then now after that, you've kind of uh, built five business businesses around essentially um testing and testing pattern so yep. if anything i don't think that there is anybody who is as well versed with the usmle step one two and three uh, better than you because at uh, at some point in time you took these three exams you passed them for your own uh you know uh career advancement and then then you started businesses to help students what in your can if you can give us like a general timeline yeah. From sure. the time that you took the test, step one and step two, let's focus on those two because our students need to finish those two before they graduate. Of course, of course. And how has it changed since the time you you took the test for the first time to today when you're teaching students? We had the pandemic. We saw like monumental changes in the exam. Yes. Even USMLE has come out and said that they, have ne they haven't made changes like this in decades that they've done in the last couple of years. So why don't you tell, talk to us a little bit about that? Sure, sure, sure. So, I mean, ideally, before we begin, you know, a lot of students have asked me, hey, you haven't taken the test in 10 plus years. How do you know? Well, when we prep our students, right, we, we mm -hmm. see their success. We see what works, what doesn't. We adjust, we adapt. And then eventually we come up with a formula that works for everybody, right? So that's mm -hmm. why even though I haven't taken the test recently, I feel that every student that comes that works with us I've taken the test because right. I see what works and what doesn't. Absolutely. Way back when, when I took it, it was a lot easier because um, there was the structure was different. It was more buzzwords. It was more if you can understand some phrases, you can recall the information. Resources mm -hmm. were not as as a, a large amount of resources as we have today. The technology was different, right? So we right. had. Just few resources versus now people have lots of their saturated with resources but the exam itself has has come to a point where um it's getting tougher because it's the way they ask the questions they take a simple disease that you know about and they just create such a way that's third order it's not just first order they actually have different steps that you need that you must know to get the right answer so that's why step one is challenging um They've changed it from scores because we had scores back then, and little by little they keep adding, they keep increasing. The minimal. They, you good? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, they keep increasing the the passing uh, score to eventually fast forward to when they say, "Hey, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go pass or fail." Right. So that's step one. It used to be a score. They used to increase the number eventually. Now they went from fifty questions down to forty. <laughs> It's more challenging. Why? Okay. Because you can make, you have to make, you have to get more questions right. So right. step one okay. is more difficult in many ways, specifically for that. It's not recall as far as buzzwords. It's more of just being able to connect the dots. Uh, okay. step one. So you're saying that step one exam has become conceptual, a lot more conceptual than it was before. And this Correct. change is relatively recent or has it been on for like say half a decade 10 years already and or is I, I, it just evolving every year you know it evolves because again these questions are written by mds and mm. phds all over the world right, right. They, they, they've been created for the purpose of usmle so i would say in the last maybe six to seven years they started bumping up um the cutoff point to eventually changing the style the format of questions to then allowing Q banks like U World and Boss to adjust because that's what we use Q banks. We right, right, right. To test and fail, take it again. Ideally, we want to use a Q bank. So, step one got to a point where when they decided to go pass or fail, they did it to alleviate stress because a lot of us out there 
without a high score on step one, your future is over in certain specialties. That's that's right. how I grew up in medicine. Right, you right, right. High on step, you will never be a surgeon. Excuse right, me? right. No, you have a passion, but Stavros, right. you will never be. Right, right. They chose to make it into pass or fail. Do you know because of that, all the numbers dropped? You can go on usassembly.org. You okay. You can see the numbers have dropped. MDs, yeah. American. But by, by numbers dropped, you mean less two people are passing the test? Correct. Correct. Okay, so, and this is systemic all, across the United States. Even U.S. schools are facing the same thing. Correct. So, okay, because they have it on USAmy.org, it's American medical students, international, uh, which are foreign, Caribbean, and international. Okay. All their passing rates, the passing scores, have <laughs> all dropped, including DO schools too. So, okay, and that's accessible. You know, we could put the link right. at one point. It's right, there. Right. Sure. We'll do that. So, yeah. um, by how much do you think it's actually dropped, or how much at least? Uh, from your experience dealing with all these schools and all these uh, students and teachers, what do you think that percentage is? As would like ballpark, it doesn't have to be accurate, but from sure, your experience, sure. I mean, when when a when a test has a ninety eight percent chance in the American, let's say American students, and it goes down to like ninety four, when the Caribbeans are ninety four and now it goes to ninety one, you might think three, four, five percent isn't that that much, but when you see a consistent drop in passing scores all across the board, mm -hmm. and then when I myself talk to medical schools and students and they say, Dr. Stavros, most of my class can't pass a comp exam. Most of my class can't pack in, pass an NBME, which is what we do yeah. and sponsor to pass a step. Well, it's a nice safety net, but there's a problem, isn't it? Well, right. there, it's either the test is getting more difficult, which it is, but we, the community, medical school, students, programs, have to work harder to say, okay, mm -hmm. because everyone's dropping, there's a reason. We have to figure out what to do. And a lot of people don't put the time into prepping step one because they figure, hey, it's pass or fail. But yeah, the problem is if you do fail, my era back then, if you fail, you come back with a score and you yes. can prove whoever's looking at your application that this student failed, but now they came with a high, maybe 40 points higher than average. Mm -hmm. Versus now, if you fail once with a pass, you, if you fail, you come back with a pass, you can't show to the person looking at your application that you scored a 260, you see? That's why it's, yeah. in, it's important to pass on first attempt. But So uh, it's funny that you say that, that students uh, are kind of not, like just because it's pass or fail, the the amount of effort that they're putting in seems to have gone down. Yes, I can and, say yes. yes. And and we see that with students. Uh, it seems like a normal trend amongst at least our students is that after they do well on the NBMEs, they go on vacation, <laughs> and <laughs> then they go. Let's all go together. <laughs> <laughs> So it's they've not, been, it seems, no, but I'm, I'm actually I, I, being very I, I, serious about this. I, and I don't know if you're seeing this amongst your students. I mean, because I'm localized to St. James students. And it seems to be a trend that a lot of students are like, hey, I did pretty well in the comp. I need a breather. I'm going to go on vacation. And they go on vacation. I would personally, like, and, and of course, I'm right around your age. In my time, you don't go on vacation until your end goal is met, which is step sure. one. Sure. You don't go on vacation for the NBMEs. And this is something that honestly only happened after the scoring went away. We yeah. never saw this before. Yeah, yeah. And I, I'm beginning to think that this is the, the mentality. Like, it's like, hey, you know, I did really well. I mean, uh, and the NBME gives you some sort of a passing percentage if you take the step within... X number of days, you're gonna. This is your probability. If they see a high probability, they're like, "I'm gonna pass anyway, so I'm gonna go on vacation." And they go on vacation, and they come back, and they've kind of forgotten everything. They're out of the groove, sure, and they're not doing well. What's your take on that? So before we continue, I think we look pretty good for our age. We're aging very well, so that's a good thing. Props <laughs> to us. Um, to go back to that, I have um, to add some some to that to what you just mentioned. Our generation, yes, we hustle, we grind, we go. Mm -hmm. The difference is I feel that the, the, the discipline, you know, we work hard. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, I feel those who want to take a break, it's either A, you know, they just they feel like ah, it's a pass or fail, but also sometimes because they're so stressed, mm -hmm. they're so exhausted, and they're so burnt out, 
because maybe you know the studying the habits of balancing time management that they need to take a break so in some instances people need to kind of get get away but when they come back like you said they they're not in the zone mm -hmm. um, i feel the pressure is gone and because of that they don't push like cs which we'll discuss a little later okay. there's no cs okay so why buy a book for the cs exam clinical skills okay things, you guys step one is a foundation for step two i have a student that just scored very high in step two 262. he worked really hard caribbean student for step one worked really hard like you guys out there right mm -hmm. during rotations and bmes and the rotations and shelf exams he pushed hard he took four weeks four and a half weeks to take step two you know why because he did all the work from step one uh -huh. all through rotations trust me he didn't want to study on the weekends right. he didn't want to study at night his family right. was at the beach but he goes to me you know what i did i did what you told me to do and when i had ready for step two he now has the door open emergency surgery uh -huh. anesthesia why wow because he invested and he gave up a little earlier to now he's like yo the whole year i'm going to relax respect yeah. <laughs> because i could apply for the match with a high score yeah that's am easy that's so those of us that i work with and those of us listening now talking if you think pass or fail is nothing you might just pass barely pass but then yeah. it's going to catch you later for step two it, i'm telling you well so if you take anything out of this podcast is if you really want it that bad you know you work hard right. and if not we'll like we discussed other options in medicine, but yeah, the yeah. pass or fail has alleviated the pressure from us, which that was the goal to do. But everyone's like, "Oh, I, I don't have to study that much. I just got to, I just got to pass the thing." Okay, good. Okay. You get caught later. I, I've never hmm. seen it otherwise. It always happens. So I, 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 I want to like talk about this a little bit more sure. in sure. the sense that. Um, so, so for example, most Caribbean schools follow, uh, so there are two ways to do a curriculum, right? A subject-based or a system-based. Yep. And most Caribbean schools tend to follow a subject-based approach, including St. James. But St. James is a little different because we have a hybrid where we do a review in a system format. Correct. Um, in your experience... And and I would say 80 to 90 percent of Caribbean medical schools follow a subject based or they're following something like us, which is kind of a hybrid mixture of both. Yeah. In your And, and the reason we do this hybrid is because uh, we feel like once you teach everything on a subject base, the system kind of brings it all back. That's it. But in your mind, is there a particularly more advantageous approach versus um, in, in between subject and system? You know, everyone learns differently. So okay. what I've what I realized is from the majority of students I've worked with and myself when I when I went through curriculums, especially St. James, subject is the best because when you're sitting, when you start in medical school from the first time, because this is okay. clearly you start in medical school for a reason, yeah. you get really confused when you take a system like cardio and you hit everything within cardio because it's all it's it's broken down that way versus you go little by little, you learn anatomy first, histology, embryology. Mm -hmm. You can appreciate the biochemistry of things. Okay. You can appreciate microbiology, the bacteria, the viruses, and all the bugs and drugs. And then when you get to systems, oh, we're doing cardio? Yeah, you know, you learn the cardio, but then when you go over micro, you say, but I've been exposed to micro. I've been exposed okay. to the bugs. So now I can appreciate the differential of a cardiological disease. Okay. Say, Interesting. The person has... Or like respiratory, first has pneumonia. But then now I can understand why the pneumonia he has is actually tuberculosis, because I did it before, which then I know why it's TB, what drug we provide, what's the mechanism of action, and so on. So I've realized for the majority, system is not for everyone. It's usually okay. subject first, and then hit the systems hard to bring it all together. Others okay. do it the other way, but it's more challenging that way. I think okay. it's okay. more challenging. More challenging. Okay. Well, that's good to know. So the other question I did have for you, and this is kind of a big debate, among, especially among medical students. I because love medical, Let's go. Yeah, Let's go. medical students don't want to take the NBME because they think, oh, I don't want to take the NBME. I, without passing step one, I want to be able to do clinicals. Sure. St. James, we don't allow that. You yep. have to take past the NBME. If you get a passing score on the NBME, that is the only time you are allowed to take step one. Yep. If you clear step one, that is when you're allowed to go into 
uh, clinicals. Yes. Most of our clinical uh, uh, partners, like the hospitals, they man they're all teaching hospitals. They mandate that the students have step one. It's not yeah. like if we wanted to, we could even send students without step one. Correct. However, there are like, you know, there I think you know this, Dr. Stavros, there are over 75 Caribbean medical schools. Only about 20 are accredited. Um, so the ones that aren't accredited um, tend to just push students into clinicals. Let them slide uh, in. So, so and then a lot of students are like, and we've had students transfer out, good students, come and say, hey, you know what? I don't want to go through the grind of step one. I want okay. to start clinicals right away. So I'm going to go to an unaccredited school because... You know, they're promising the sun and the moon and everything in between. And because of that, I'm going to ace it. I'm going to get into clinicals without step one. I'm going to yeah. finish clinicals. And then I'm going to take step one and step two together. Sure. What's your thought on that? So I want to mention something. Um, mm. This is from my experience. Mm -hmm. And this is because I can say what I want to say. Usually mm -hmm. it, it, it parallels, if not, you know, really uh, the same as, as what I see with student success. Mm -hmm. The best way to approach this is to struggle and push now to pass step. Because if you don't take the NBME, clearly you don't know if you're going to pass or fail. Fine. Mm -hmm. Those schools that don't, uh, don't really require NBMEs, you fail once or twice. I hope everyone understands that even if you fail once or twice, some states in the country will never give you a license. Oh, wow. Some states in the country have requirements to say, okay, you come to my state, we want first attempts only. Okay. There are other states that have limits of four, four attempts and six. Mm -hmm. And there's a website I'll provide to you guys. You can put okay. it on. Um, so that's that. So you can get licensed elsewhere, but some states will never give you a license if you failed one, one of the exams. That's that. Okay. Let's go to jumping over. Okay. We decide to tell students, you know what? You don't need to take the NBME. Forget about the step. Start rotations. They go through rotations. They learn now step two, clinical knowledge. They finish everything. Your school's happy, meaning whoever school's doing this. And now the students are stuck. I'll say the word stuck for a reason. To go back and learn step one and step two. Okay. I have met very few students, very few, that were able to attack one and two together in this in this form, if this in this new way of of directing students, because it they lose they lose hope eventually. They go, I finished my mm. rotations, I paid for my tuition, my my everything, everything's good. Now who's going to help me? I got to go back and learn everything again after yeah. a year and a half of rotations, right? It's two years, two Four years, yeah, year, and then a year of electives. So it's two years of learning clinical knowledge, and some will say, well. I can take clinical knowledge first, step two, and then step one. Okay. The chances of, of passing step two are higher because you've just finished rotations. But that's step one, guys. Without that step one, you're not going anywhere. And okay. I would say 90% of people that I know that have attempted this, 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 this style, this routine, have never finished step one. They've done step two. Okay. If step one has been their, their, um, their nightmare. And because yep. of that, they eventually jump out and they do something else in medicine. Right. And and I think uh, because of that recently, relatively recently, uh, the NBME actually doesn't allow that anymore. They don't allow you to take, they have, you have to go sequentially. You have yeah. to have a passing score in step yes. one. Yes. <laughs> but I think that that's recent. And when you're telling me this, it kind of makes sense that they introduced this because a lot of students must have done that. They probably took step two and got stuck in step one. They don't have step one. They just have step two. So you, know. you, you think it's not a good idea to do that, right? Like... Well, we'll probably get emails. I, I, guys, I get that. But you have to understand one thing. The reason why we take it, first of all, NBMEs, I don't like. I'll be on record. I, I like them for what we use them for. Mm -hmm. I just feel all the schools, including St. James, mm -hmm. we need to do something better about adjust, helping students adapt sure. from Q banks yeah. to NBME. Even I, when I do right. them, I'm like, wow, these are not easy. Like, this right. is like when you're doing a Q bank reading questions, they spoon feed you everything. Okay. NBMEs are meant to do two things. They give you a 200 question exam. The first 100 questions, you don't have a break. The questions are very short, two lines, bare minimum. They go, what? But the Q banks are three paragraphs and they're 40 questions. They figure if you're able to answer a 200 question exam and give you the bare minimum and you can still get it right, that means you know the concepts, you know the, the foundation uh -huh. of medicine, which that means 
you walk into the actual exam where they have 40 questions instead of 50, and they have three paragraphs instead of two lines, it's been, it, 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 you're going to pass, right? That's the okay. whole concept behind NBMEs. So, yeah, those who are failing in BMEs, it's not, it's usually concept, but it's also they're not exposed okay. to the way the questions are written. Right. So, what, what I'm mean. hearing is that it sounds like the step one exam has become a very conceptual exam. So, essentially, if you go and memorize entire U World and AMBOSS and U, uh, first aid, yada, 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 you're probably not going to pass because you didn't understand anything. Right. Well, back then when I was taking it, we had something called buzzwords. We yeah. had um, certain resources that we memorized because it was like that. Okay. Now you can memorize anything you want. If you're a photographic memory, fine, you'd be passing everything. It's very hard to memorize everything because even mm -hmm. then they need you to connect. If you don't okay. connect, you can't pass. That's gotcha. all it is. Gotcha. Yeah. They've, they've adjusted it. <laughs> and more. now talk to me about step two. Step two also has had a lot of dramatic changes. Oh. So why don't you walk us through what the changes have been in the last decade? So step two had two two brackets, uh, clinical skills, <clears throat> clinical knowledge. Okay. Clinical knowledge was the basic exam that teach to, to see what you know in your rotation. So mm -hmm. you go through all the cores, surgery, gen surg, pediatrics, ob gyn family psych, peds, and then you take a test. That okay. test is going to see what you know. Fair. Um, that's also challenging in itself. The CS exam, clinical skills, was something that I mastered, that I loved, that I was teaching to doctors all over the world because there were five locations in the country where you have to fly in if you were not in the States. Philadelphia was one of them. Chicago was another one. Five, mm -hmm. you know, you come in, you see 12 patients. They were not, they were actors. They weren't real patients, but they would test your skills. They had a huge list of like a, a score, a score report, like a checklist, empathy, mm -hmm. sympathy, medical knowledge i mean everything and people would fail maybe their english part or their uh bedside manner part right so that was very challenging but it actually was one of the best exams because it brought to attention that you need to not only know medicine but you need to know how to handle the patients right okay right so the pandemic came it was on hold they froze it like everything froze for a while and they thought about possibly going to uh, an online version. And eventually, fast forward, they released a statement that they were. Fast forward, they released a statement on one morning. And they said, ladies and gentlemen, we've decided to pull the license exam completely off our, uh, our list. So you don't have to take it anymore. Okay. Right. So that was out. One less exam for everybody. Problem was, though, that people were going through rotations, not really uh, checking their clinical skills. And then now to this day, I'm, I'm in relationships with many different re residency programs, uh, family uh, program directors, and they've told me, they go, our, our, our candidates are not as strong as they were in their clinical skills. Mm -hmm. And that's a combination of the exam and virtual rotations. I mean, I know we maybe have done them, a lot of us. We had to, to move on. Most of the students that I know have. But you can't learn through the computer. You have to be touching the patient. You got to be hands-on, right? So the yeah. clinical skills was something that was a huge blow in the community. It was good for students, but now we see the the, the after, we, we see the blow. Students are not working on clinical skills. They don't really know what to do and how to do it. So it's challenging. Okay. Um, and, and what about CK? CK was always the knowledge portion, but are you seeing, I mean, I believe even that test has changed. Are you seeing reduced pass rates in CK as well, like you're seeing in step one? What's your experience with that? So the CK exam now is, is the big, biggest exam to focus on because once you pass step one, again, mm -hmm. step one is important because if you don't pass, you automatically can't license in some states, fair. And, and granted, when you pass with a P, you're still on the same level with everyone else. It's a P, mm -hmm. keep it pass. Now step two has its highlight. Now it's famous. Like, oh, well, now I, you, know, you have to score very high. Mm -hmm. So the pressure was taken off of step one. Now it's on step two. Before step two really wasn't that big. It was like, ah, right. oh, step one was a pressure. Right. So you'll similarly, I feel, changed it up and just put the pressure on step two. So step two is more challenging. Step two is eight blocks instead of seven. So you might think it's nothing. But if I asked you to run a marathon and when you finish, say, all right, run five more miles. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't run marathons. I run 5Ks. <clears throat> Same concept. You do right. seven. Now let's do four, 40 more, right? Wow. So, and step two is, is all about learning the stuff in the hospital. So at the end of the day, 
the pressure has gone from step one. You still got to pass it. Now step two, you got to score super high or else you can't get into some specialties. It's actually more challenging because that's what they require. So they just shifted the pressure around. Um, it is challenging because what if you don't have a strong rotation? What if you go and your preceptor mm -hmm. isn't teaching you everything? It's up to you to go home and study, right? I, I didn't okay. study. I would go home and relax personally. I'm like, I don't want to keep <clears throat> reading. I'm tired. Okay. It catches up to you. Okay. So it's, it's a lot of pressure everywhere. And mm -hmm. that's why now with step two doctors I work with, yes, failing. I don't think people fail step two as much because they're working hard on step one. Right. Transition over. Those who don't do well are those who perhaps are not in medical school anymore. They're trying mm -hmm. to come to the States and they just on their own uh, in the living room, uh, back room. And it's hard, right? I mean, if you're by yourself, I mean, we have each other. We're on Zoom now talking, right. on, you know, virtually. Right. There's our home all day studying. I don't know about you, but if you don't have a certain support system. Cabin fever, yeah. Oof, you're going to drop fast. And those are the wow. ones that I usually see fail because they go, I, okay. I can't do it. I don't know what to do anymore. There's no right. guidance, right? That's where I come in. <laughs> that's That's awesome. So, I mean, so generally it sounds like I mean, we've always been talking about how the U.S. is really trying to increase the number of physicians. Sure. Um, because we're by introducing, by merging of DO and MD, then introducing so many new DO schools. Sure. Um, et cetera, et cetera. Allowing, you know, investing more in residencies for IM and FM, yep. et cetera. But on the flip side, they might be increasing the opportunities, but they're also tightening the clamps, it looks like, yeah. from the step one and step two yeah. portion, because they're not letting... They want better quality to fill those more positions that they're creating. Yes. And, and for those out, we need to know this, that U.S. Assembly used to have six attempts. Now it's four. So yes. Six. So yeah. people, unfortunately, you know, I, I get it. You were tired, exhausted. <clears throat> Issues happened. You took the test. Somebody passed away in your family. I, I understand, right? But at the end of the day, if you fail four times, you're out of the system completely. They figure right. you can't pass the first three or the first four the chance of getting a tenure residence or slim to none, unless you know somebody very well. Even then, right. it's not 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 it, it's not going to be uh, successful. So, that's the risk. Yeah, you, the top, tied in the clamp. Yeah, you know, it's a it's medicine, guys. You, you're applying for a job, right? In, right. A, in a top university or hospital program that you are one day helping people with their with their health. Right? Yeah. Look up to their you. Lives. Yeah. Their lives. Yeah. Their lives. Sure, lives. Of course. So it is challenging. It's doable. We gotta. You have to navigate well. Or yeah. else it's very yeah. hard to get in. That's right. I, I always tell people that uh, actually both entrepreneurship as well as medicine, these are not professions. These are lifestyle choices. Oh, lifestyle. Thousand, and, thousand okay. Percent. Yeah. And because it seems like it's like the amount of work that goes in, oh. the amount of time that goes in to both of these professions, um, depending on what kind of an entrepreneur you are. But this is not nine to five. If you are looking for a nine to five and work-life balance, what would you say like this particular you know i think the a big buzzword nowadays especially in the workforce across the board uh <coughs> is oh work-life balance what would you say to somebody who would comment or make those comments especially in the and 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 at the same breath they're saying i want to be a physician so those who know me will know me well and i i always you know we always speak the truth right tough love mm -hmm. yeah. if you're in medical school and you realize maybe you're failing or you're struggling semester after semester. Okay. Mm -hmm. You figure out why, right? It, eventually it has to be the individual, you know, schools can do what they can. They, they can't spoon feed. They teach you the best they can. Mm -hmm. But I realize sometimes students go to school because of family, because there's some yeah. pressure, which I, I know they want the best for us, our parents. But, yeah. hey, maybe it's not for me. Maybe I don't right. want it. Then you slide somehow finishing med school. Right. You get into residency or you hope to get in. We realize there's no passion. You eventually will burn out, get exhausted, get frustrated, and not live your life, not love your life. So I would say if you're watching this now and you are in medical school and you realize, man, it's not for me, I, you know, I don't want to say jump out, but maybe another option would be beneficial for you because time is valuable, right? Yeah. It's your life. It's your future. And then if you are in, in, in rotations, this is what I didn't do, which I want you guys all to do now. When I knew I didn't want to be a pediatrician, I did my peds rotation. I'm like, all right, I'm just going to go and get out. But what if I put my heart and soul into it to expose myself to all of it? Mm -hmm. Maybe I would have been like, hey, wow, this is actually pretty cool versus, yeah, I know I don't want to, right? So so okay. this is different stages because right, the biggest right. thing I've seen are doctors choosing a specialty. <clears throat> well, I have one guy, a couple of guys that did internal medicine peds. They got mm -hmm. into residency. 
Second year, they want to get out. I'm like, well, what happened? Like, you knew it's no right. surprise. They didn't love. They just didn't see the sums do. They see the sums do. They see themselves doing it. Have one uh, anesthesiologist. He finished anesthesiology in Northwestern. Love the guy. He goes, I don't want to practice. I'm like, why not? I'm tired. I'm like, tired. <laughs> top university in the states. Great yeah. guy, friend of mine. You know, top yeah. residency, Northwestern Chicago. Right. Are you kidding me? Untouchable. He goes, I'm right. good. I don't want to do it. So something clicked. He goes, I don't see uh -huh. myself living my life, even if I'm making the money, yeah. to be doing this. So I ask okay. of you from now, see, talk to your doctors, talk to your preceptors, now dig and say, hey, you know, what do you, what's a daily life in a pediatrician? Right, right, or right, right. A cardiothoracic surgeon. Do you know what that what right. that takes? Yeah. You should. Or else it's it's a life. Like you yeah. said, life to us, not a job. Yeah. You gotta love it, guys, or you're not gonna make it. You're not. You're gonna um, so, it's just out of curiosity, well, what is this particular uh, gentleman doing? Who was the anesthesiologist oh, from Northwestern? Good. He he was one of my coaches at a previous company for a while, and then now okay. he went to the East Coast to pursue a specialty more in uh, admin. So he has anesthesiology. Uh, he's board certified. But he's using his his knowledge, his education, his experience in, in uh, more academia and the oh, university. Okay. Universities need MDs too, guys. So oh, yeah. things have yeah. changed. Things are right. like when I see an influx of people coming to me, they want a job mm -hmm. and they're leaving 400 to get a lower salary to coach students. Yeah. There's a reason why. So yeah. it could be anything from burning out. The program was too intense. Time management. They are they were lo in love with it, but now they yeah. don't like it. Which we, we're human, right? We're not yeah. robots, so things change. Be no, honest. That's a very good point. We actually do a lot of work with Northwestern, um, and great, you know, pretty much cool. in their medical school, most of the folks are actually like physicians. Like they have an MD, they're board certified, but. They're doing admin work. So it's, it's a very good point that you bring up. So that truly is another avenue for uh, physicians to get into academia. And like their head of research, for example, if I'm not mistaken, uh, she's obviously an MD, but she's not an active practicing MD from my understanding. But she's board certified and like yeah, obviously has a yeah. license and everything. But she's teaching. So. And you and everyone that I, I meet, you know, I travel a lot and they go to me, wow, you know, I, I'm really, uh, you have a wonderful passion. I'm like, I'm just lucky because I love what I do. Mm -hmm. A lot of them like, well, there's no, the grass isn't greener. You just got to, you got to water yeah. where, the, where the grass is and build it yourself. Right. But a lot of people are like, you know, I, I want to do more. I have doctors who are OBGYN mm -hmm. and they started doing Botox injections. So instead right. of saying, well, instead of having all that malpractice, yeah, 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 yeah. I can get certified. I can go to women's homes. I can have yeah. my own little spa and I can start doing injections, make more money. Because That's at that point, they go to me, Dr. Stavros. I, I mean, Stavros, we're friends. They go, I don't see my kids. I mean, they go, I make a lot of money. I just don't see my family. So I've yeah. changed. Now I will do different things to enjoy my kids and make more. Yeah. That's how things are evolving now. That's what yeah, I mean, it's happening. I, and that's very interesting because this is a little philosophical and we're going on a philosophical tangent here. But I like once I read, do it. Do it um, I, I kind of remember, I think this was Elon Musk or, or a really famous person who said the difference between uh, having a lot of men, money and being rich is having control of your time. If you yes. don't have control of your time, you're never rich. Yes. If you're working, you know, a hundred and, you know, 40 hours a week Not working. and you're making a ton of money, you're not rich because you're not really being, you don't have the time to enjoy that money. Yeah. So, right. 100%. so, so that's a, it's a very good point that you bring up. It, it's uh, they're working a lot, but, and they have a lot of money, but at the same time, you know, what's the point now, now going back to money, because you know, money does make, make, make the world go around. Of yeah. course, some people choose medicine for the money. Yes. They realize residency there's no i mean it's very little <laughs> you, you'd be lucky to make six sixty five thousand uh, a year yeah three years of residence and a lot yeah. of people born in medicine don't know that they go oh, you're yeah. a doctor oh easy residency yeah. you get very little yes that's before taxes and then hopefully you get into a good specialty hopefully yes. you're going to pursue a certain university it's usually a business they have yeah. certain budgets right certain bat certain amount of money yeah. to provide so then those who go in for the money Sadly to say, many of them jump out. They go, man, I can't do it. I'm like, well, yeah, because you're going in for the money. And you realize you're going to make not the money that you wanted to make. 
So right. that's another, it's like, that's not a, it's not a, it's not a right, it's not a, it's not a solid passion to have because yeah. you run out so fast when you're not getting the money yeah. that, you, that you really want to have. Yeah. The not other easy. point I wanted to make with that residency portion is that you're working up to 80 hours. Um, it's not minimum. up to, 60 minimum. yeah, you're working minimum. 80 hours a week. And when you equate that 65,000 to 80, it's below minimum wage. That's what you're getting. And, you know, I have friends, all of us have, have survived mm -hmm. on that, whether we have investments, family support, loved ones are cooking for us every day. You make mm -hmm. it work. But think of it this way. Yeah. You know, after taxes, you're not making that much and you have to pay rent again. Again, if you have a passion, though, mm -hmm. you know, you make it happy. Like, I don't care. I'll eat mac and cheese every day. I don't yeah. care. But yeah. those who are like, well, you know what? It's not for me. Well, then you don't have the, the enough passion to go because if you have a passion, like building a business, starting from scratch, moving, taking what I knew from one to build the next one, the stronger one, there's always risk, right? But I have passion in what I do. I have, I, I'm confident in what I do, and I make it work. Yeah. You need confidence. You need to have that passion, or else it won't not it will not work for you. That's what wow. usually happens. Yeah, that's it's tough. That's, that's it's crazy. <laughs> So, um, yeah, I mean, if you uh, equate like an 80 hour work week at 65,000, that roughly equa equates to about uh, less than $15 an hour. Yeah. So, yeah. And, I mean, and, and what happens is, uh, and this is, as, again, I love examples. I was working um, at Cook County and Rush University too. And then I was working with the, was the University of Illinois surgical team, Gen Surge general surgery. And I was with the chief five year, great guy, friends to this day. He was married to a family med internal medicine. His wife was internal medicine at mm -hmm. Cook County. He was university of Illinois chief surgeon, wow. Caribbean student. Right. He goes to me. This is when I was a student. He goes, Stavros, I got to tell you, man, I love my wife, but she always gets me, gets mad at me because I don't get home in time. She's in medicine. She's yeah. a, actually chief of internal at that time. Right, right, he goes, right. He's chief of surgery. He goes, honey, I can't come home till I finish my surgery. Right. By the way, someone just came in 10 minutes ago and I got to have a four hour procedure. Even yeah. then, they didn't understand. So you see, it's tough. Like it's uh -huh. no matter wow. what, passion, sacrifice, being the mm -hmm. right person, you have to set it up the right way. It's not a sprint, it's a race. And if you don't right. have a support system by your side, it's challenging guys, right. it really is. A lot, a lot of obstacles to <laughs> overcome every day. So, uh, Dr. Stavros, as far as your um, um, your your agency is concerned, your institution yep. is concerned, helping yep. students. Um, if any of our students are stuck, what what would you recommend they do? How would they reach out to you? Uh, is there a circumstance when you look at a student and you're like, yeah, this guy is beyond help. I can't help him. Well, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, good, sorry. No, <laughs> so that's why. Have you had such? Are are you like? rejecting students are are you willing to help anybody uh what's the like how do you what what should a student do when should they reach out to you so a couple of things i'm always mm -hmm. a believer of providing the best advice i possibly can mm -hmm. and sometimes we're not meant to work with some people because they need more prep they right. need more time to build the foundation because maybe they're out of school right but if i as long as i can provide some advice for them to get on the right track. Maybe they come back to me a year from now, two years from now, maybe never, but at least they have the right information instead of going online, searching different forums, which I like, but mm -hmm. you gotta be careful who's out there because how, how can you credit? There's no credibility. You don't know who's right. saying what, where, how. So usually medical students, first semester, second semester, third, fourth, fifth, um, preparing for step little by little, is the majority of doctors we work with. We work with doctors, you know, in the Caribbean, international. As long as you are in school, outside of school, and you want to dedicate and sacrifice, we work with everybody. You know, very okay. few do we say, hey, I can't work with you, unless literally okay. they can't dedicate an hour a day, which is very rare, right? Okay. So if they visit usmlytrainings.com forward slash step one, they can right. go to the website. They'll see my, my webinar, right. learn everything reach out to us if you need to. You'll talk right. to me or my staff. And if we feel that you need prep now versus, hey, you need to come back to us a few months from now, this is why we do what we do best and why all of our students pass. It's just given the right guidance, the right support, Okay. make sure they do well. All so right. Yeah, I mean, that's the whole point. You got to sacrifice, right? right? And navigate, we'll do it for you, with you. Right. And, and you mentioned that all of your students pass. Um, like, is there like an official statistic on that or? You know why they all pass? 
because, and I'm, I, I, we all say, oh, guarantee. The reason why they all pass is if, they, and again, I'm honest, there's some students I don't let, I, I do not, I do not allow them to pat, to take the test because oh, they can come on and work with us for two months, but then they're not strong enough. I'm like, well, I did everything I could. I, there's no way I can sponsor you. I can actually, uh, you know, advise for you to take your step one because you're still lacking in X, Y, and Z. So then, you know, we provide a little more support. They keep working on their weaknesses and then they go past the test because this is their future, right? I mean, I, right. Can't, I can't allow somebody under my support, under our, our team to take the test and fail because when they do, they can't license in some states. Their journey becomes much more difficult. Right. And many of them are like, man, I got it. What am I supposed I gave up my family and I failed. So yeah. I take it personal. That's why those right. who work with us, you're not going in unless, like you said, NBMEs and assessments. Right. So I'm, I, I can honestly say no one has failed under the guidance that I've provided, following the right resources and the assessments that I, I need to have before you pass the test. It might take six months, might take a year, might take two weeks. Right. The fastest I've done was four weeks with a few students. But wow. again, they need to help people hear this. They go, oh, I got to do it. No, right, no, right, right. you need to have the foundation, right? You need to know the medicine and I can right. show you the test taking skills to actually right. make you a rock star pass the test. And, and what's the best period for them to reach out to you? Is it MD4? Is it MD5? Is it after they failed the NBME a bunch of times? When is the best time for them to reach out? <laughs> Don't, I mean, you can reach out to me after. I, I, would, I would say this. There's a two, two parts to this answer. A, for those who are in MD3 and 4, preparing slowly, knowing mm -hmm. that an MD5, St. James, and other schools want you to take an NBME to mm -hmm. get sponsored for the step, don't wait to the end. Come to us. We'll guide you to make sure you're on the right track. Fine. For those of you who just started medical school last week, last month, you know, mm -hmm. you're like, I don't want to listen to this guy. I'm not ready yet. Oh, no, no, I get it. But with what we do is we also have a huge library of videos. So okay. have, what I what I didn't have as a student is I had resources. Like right right. Now, you could buy videos. Yeah. And have the Q bank, but no one does it together like this. Mm. So I have some students now, they go to me, Doc, I failed step one. I failed my NBMEs. Watching your video, going through glycolysis cycle, using this question and teaching you the content behind it, I learned better that way than watching. A, videos are great, but nothing is clicking for me anymore. So for those oh, of you, yeah. like remember MD1, like for example, do you know what, what classes you teach on MD1 too? Was anatomy, histology? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so wouldn't it be nice for students to say, well, I can, I can listen to my, my professors and my doctors in St. James, but I also have a list of videos from Dr. Stavros that I can parallel to expose to questions, no pressure. So then when you get to MD3, you're like, well, I've been watching these for two semesters, three semesters. I'm getting acclimated to the style of questions, which then increases the chance of passing mm -hmm. NBME, being more disciplined because they're watching the videos. Right. And then your numbers rise because they pass faster, they get into rotations faster, yeah. they get into step two. We definitely so it's like want a domino that. Effect, right? It's just, right. They don't see it. We do. They don't see that, though. That's the problem. Right. Right. And that's the thing. I mean, if somebody yeah. has a resource, yeah. they don't necessarily know what it's like to not have that resource. I mean, that's where, you know, the whole concept of quote unquote privilege comes in. And if uh, joining an additional program gives you that privilege, why would you not take it? Because then you don't struggle for NBMB. Yeah, and again, exactly. if, you, if you realize medicine isn't for you, please, you know, and I advise a lot of students, I'm like, Truthfully, they might be married, have kids. Maybe they're doing it to make money for their loved ones. Other times, man, it's not for you. That's cool. Mm -hmm. I mean, accept it. But right, if you're right. in it and you have love for it, well, let's, let's get it done. Let's pass the test and move on. Just awesome. it's navigation, man. It's all guidance and navigation and support. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much for these valuable insights. Uh, if anybody of you need to reach out to Dr. Stavros, his contact information will be in the comments below. Um, and if you like the content that we're producing, um, give us a like, give us a follow. Uh, you can download our episodes on any one of your favorite podcast providers, such as uh, Spotify and YouTube. Um, and remember, there's no shortcut to becoming an MD. Thank you so much for tuning into our show. We hope you enjoyed another episode of Med School Minutes. If you like our content, please follow us and receive notification when a new show is posted. This podcast is brought to you by St. James School of Medicine. For a video version of this podcast, please check us out on sjsm.org slash video.